All right. I'm with Blair Saki. Everybody, welcome to Walk Ins. Welcome. Hello. Hello. I love um having female comedians on to talk about their their craft. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How did you get into comedy? Well, it's a funny story. I was not one of those people that was like, I've always wanted to do this since I was five years old. Like, <laughs> uh, like most of my friends, I actually, I just like fell into it accidentally. I, uh, I moved to New York for grad school to become a novelist. And I had just started dating a guy who was like doing open mics and showed me comedy. And uh, I had wanted to be a writer. And we broke up uh, because I moved to New York and I had started, you know, writing for split cider, like interviewing comedians and stuff. And I was interning at some magazines and I, and I pitched, a and I became a fan of comedy, like pretty instantly. I, I was like really passionate about it. Um, but my mind, you know, hadn't even close to, to tell me that I wanted to do it. And like once in a while, I would like, write a joke for my boyfriend or something, just like whatever. Um, and then like one day in the shower, I, I pitched a story on Michael Che when I was interning at W Magazine and he had just done his first week at SNL. And um, I was his first piece of press ever. And we became friends. And then like in the shower, like a couple of days later, I just like had the thought, I should do this. Uh, <laughs> and then I started pretty uh, quickly after that. <laughs> I was waiting for you to be like, and then in the shower, Michael was like, you know, you should really do comedy. <laughs> oh my God, no, definitely not. Yeah, sorry if it uh, sounded that way. <laughs> I was like, where are we heading with this story? Oh yeah, um, that would be a really crazy way to open a podcast. <laughs> you ask, I was just in the shower. <laughs> um, that is, that's really fun. I... I want to know more about like your process. So how did you, has it changed since you started doing comedy? Is it, was it always kind of the same? What's, how do you kind of work through your material? I, how long have you been doing it now? I'm a, a, a little over 10 years. Okay. Yeah. And um, I, my process is pretty close to what it was in the beginning because I'm someone who I was a writer before. And so I like very specific language. And so I'm someone that likes to write everything before. And then once I sort of have a pretty firm skeleton, I feel comfortable riffing on that um, and molding it. But I am not one of those people that quote unquote writes on stage, you know, like, mm. yeah, I like to go up there really knowing what I'm going to do. And when you got into it, were, was your family excited? Oh, definitely not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I feel like if you were going to be a novelist, going to stand-up comedy is kind of equally just like, well, either way, you're going to be struggling. Yeah, they, I mean, they definitely didn't want me to be a novelist either. Um, so... Yeah, my my dad, my parents, I think, thought that, like, going into the arts was pretty entitled. Like, mm. they uh, they have a very immigrant mentality. Not that they're immigrants, but that's just sort of, like, that vibe of just, you know, work your ass off. Like, make a good life for yourself. Um, just, like, arts just seemed, I think, a little bit frivolous to them. So mm -hmm. where are you from? I'm from Orange County. Okay. Yeah. Where, where are you from? I I moved a lot. I was born in New York City and then moved like every year and a half. And oh, then, wow. And so I've lived all over America, you know, pretty much only, but um, was in LA for the past 16 years. Uh -huh. And then... Um, now I'm in Texas, but yeah. lived in Minnesota, lived in Connecticut. My family's, we're, we're really from like the Northeast, my oh, family. Okay. Cool. So that's where they all are. And, and, um, yeah, that they're, they too kind of 
it never occurred to me to do stand up or to be a writer or anything like that. I never thought it was a path. And then when I moved to LA the first time, I was in my 20s and that, you know, people were, that's how everybody made their living. And the kids even were kind of the second generation or third generation of people who had been in the arts and made a very good living. And so it was, it was something that I was like, oh, people do this. Yeah. People can do this and survive. It's right. not just like I have to cut my ear off and be like Van Gogh. Yeah, I know. It's been such a long road. I mean, I got on the, a MTV show when I was about two years in to comedy. And so that was really... Um, I Which like, show? Uh, it's like, uh, it's called Ladylike. It was under the Girl Code umbrella. It only mm -hmm. lasted one season, but it was just like this bizarre thing. Like, I cold auditioned. Like, I didn't have reps or anything. I was on break from my computer coding job that I lied to get. Um, and uh, I definitely- Did you lie about being able to code? Yes. I <laughs> I had expensive rent and I looked up like what I needed on a resume. I studied all the questions that would be asked in a coding interview and <laughs> definitely did not think that I would get it, you know, and I sort of just skewed like my real life resume towards that. Um, and I mean, nobody was more stunned than me when I got that job. Uh, but I left <laughs> to go audition during a lunch break. And um, of course, I was gone three hours because they were so late on the auditions. But then I did end up getting it and I quit that job. So so you never had to learn to code? <laughs> no, I did code. I was at it for two years. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. So did what did you go to school? Did you go to school? College? Yeah. Yeah, I went to UCLA and then I went, I got my master's at the new school when I was going to be a novelist. I finished my degree because I clearly, I never thought comedy was going to be my career. Like that didn't even cross my mind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I was just okay. like, I thought I was just having some wild, like New York experience, you know? Yeah. That's, uh, I can really relate to that as someone who just took a break from it and got back and was like, ugh, I thought that I would be able to like, Put this behind me. Oh, comedy! You just started again. Yeah, I took a break. I was the, I was at it for like seven years, and then um, I got married, had a baby, and really the pan it all happened around the pandemic. And so, uh, and I was writing and doing all of, all these other things, and I kind of was like, ah, eh, maybe that was just like a nice phase. And That's so cool! Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So um, I got back up kind of hoping that I would bomb <laughs> and that I would be like, well, that was a nice phase, seven year phase or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And um, and no, now I just want to do it all the time again. Oh, that's great. That means you really love it. I do. It's always been that thing that I, I felt like um, I too just kind of fell into it. Somebody dared me to do it. and. I was like, all right. And it never occurred to me that you could really be a female comedian. I think there, I, you know, Roseanne was, there were a few when I was growing up, but I remember the first time I ever saw, I think it was Whitney Cummings money shot special. I was like, oh, you can do, <laughs> women can do this and make money. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, that didn't really occur to me. Yeah. I mean, it's been interesting. Uh, yeah, seeing how the career part goes. <laughs> yeah, what has been the, you know, after your MTV show, what, what's been kind of the ups and downs of it? Do you, f did you have any dark nights of the soul where you were like, I'm not doing this, forget it? Um, I mean, I haven't really had dark nights of the soul where I was like, I'm going to quit. Um, but I have had many dark nights of the soul. I mean, like, I I think my last day job was 2018. Um, so a lot of times, like, even in struggles, I, like, have to be like, you know what? I'm making a living supporting myself, um, doing what I love. And instead of just being like, okay, why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? Um, and 
you know, my getting on a TV show like two years into comedy, like skewed my perception sort of, you know, thinking Mm. like, oh, it's all going to be this easy. And for some people it is, you know, Um, but I've been lucky. I mean, I work really hard, but I've been pretty lucky of how things have gone. I mean, like there were many years I was so broke, like working in time. I remember having like a nine to five in New York and then going out doing shows, mics all night, like just sleeping like four or five hours. And I, I'm just like, oh my God, I never slept, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, you know, I've had Adrian Appalucci on here for a few times and I love talking to her about when she was working like her temp day job and then doing the same thing and grinding at night. And like, what am I doing? This is insane. Never sleeping. Yeah, that's how you know, I guess you really love it. Like, and all that time too, you're not even making money. That was like not, I mean, it's really insanity. It's like some- It's insanity. Freaks, it's like some sort of compulsion, you know? Yeah. And then like, I mean, last year in the last like couple of years, last like three years, like I was on the road three weekends a month. Um, That was really gnarly because I'm trying, I just like pushed some dates because I was like, you know what? I, I just put out the special and- I need a little break. I need to live to even have something to write about, you know? Yeah. Um. So your special came out and are you generally on the road? Are you, or was that just, you're not, are you like a road dog generally kind of all, full time or is it not really, what's your kind of. I mean, it kind of has been like the la- that the last three years. Like, I'm not trying to do that. I mean, I'll always like go on the road, but I'm not trying to be one of those people where I'm on the road, you know, probably three weekends out of the year. Yeah, um, that's a little too much for me. I I'm I have shows in development right now. I'm always auditioning. Uh, so I'm trying to find a probably a little bit more balance as I get older. You know, I want to be able to go on the road when I want to and not have that be my only, you know, sense of income or whatever. Yeah. And how did you worked with Veeps, right? This is um, is it do you like it? How has it been? It seems really cool that you can you can kind of uh, chat and like all this. It the, the functions it has are awesome. Oh, thanks. Uh, so. Yeah, I was part of their launch of their comedy division. It's like Live Nation's new streamer. Um, a lot of, you know, it's like a brand new thing. So yeah, uh, when I'm promoting it, a lot of times it's the first time people are hearing about it. But, you know, it's not like other streamers <laughs> that it, Live Nation is a huge backing, like obviously very established company. So that's nice. And um, they were great to work with. I love the way it came out. I'm so proud of it. Uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was a really good experience. It looks gorgeous. And it, yeah, it's, the streaming capabilities are really clearly Live Nation-esque. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely not like some janky new upstart. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, it's cool too that you can kind of, I don't know, I just, I, I love the idea of being able to kind of buy those tickets whenever you want or join when it premieres and be part of everybody chatting. It's, and it seems like it streams. So the quality was just really, really high. It's just beautiful. Where did you shoot it? I shot it at the bourbon room in Hollywood. Oh, okay. Are you in Los Angeles now? I'm in Los Angeles. I really wanted for my first special to be able to have all my friends and family there. And I'm so glad I did that because it was really fun. And that was just sort of the vibe that I wanted. Yeah, you seemed very relaxed. You always seem like you're having fun, though. Even when you were on Corden, you seemed like you were just having a blast. Thanks. It's funny. uh, It's funny you bring up Corden because I had been submitting, like trying to find a set um, for a while. And I, I mean, I started, I think I probably started submitting like three, four years in. And uh, I, by the time it actually worked, because it is just so, I don't even consider myself a dirty comic, but to find a airtight, clean 
five minutes that you're just like, you know, is going to be bam, 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 bam. It was so hard. And and by the time I did it, I was like, oh, I'm really glad I didn't do this earlier in my career because by the time I did do it, it was just no big deal. You know, yeah. it was like not stressful at all. Yeah. Did, did you, do you get nervous at all? Uh, I do get nervous sometimes. It always surprises me when I do. Um, it just depends on the situation. Usually it'll be something like I need to do well or something, you know, or, um, yeah. I, I mean, like obviously for a TV set yeah, now, like I've done enough stuff where I, I'll be nervous before, but once I'm like one to two minutes in or something, I, I'm pretty it relaxed. You know, once it, yeah. I start get going, I'm pretty relaxed, but I still get nervous before sometimes, especially if it's something high pressure or that means a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I always want to know how people deal with it because I, st I've, I have stage fright and it, never, it goes away like one, two minutes in, but it's never, I've never been able to really like conquer it. I remember early in comedy, I would go into green rooms and comics who had been doing it forever would just be sleeping on the couch. And I'm like, I want to get to that point where I'm just sleeping before a show. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, I think I know a lot of people that have been doing it so long and still get nervous. I mean, if I'm just doing regular sets at the comedy store or something. I'm not nervous, but um, it's just when a, something really matters. I think it's completely natural. It just means you care, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's um, it is like such a, you know, I've had so many comedians on this podcast and we always talk about what, a like you said, it's insanity to do. It's not. A normal thing you're doing it the grind is um relentless and not for everybody and i'm often not sure it's for me uh the i don't know it just seems like it takes a long time for it to kind of pay any dividends and that you are only hearing about the stories where it does usually from people you're not hearing about all the people we lose along the way or drop out or do it for a while and don't really break through. Uh, what do you, what's your, your feeling about being someone who's been doing it for like over a decade now? What, what do you think it takes to, to really have that stick to it? Um, well, I think that comedy is something like, it's just some fun thing in your twenties, but once you get in your thirties, it's like, this is my real life. Like, am I going to be uh, able to buy a house, have a family? Like, you know, yeah. and the amount of people that are doing it now, I mean, you really have to go hard. Um, I have recently learned, like, I thought I was, I've always been someone where I like, I'm like, I have to be really true to myself you know, and so I wasn't really like doing the social media end of things. Yeah. Um, and I recently was like, I just thought I'll, I'm going to do this my own way. Like this doesn't feel authentic to me. And then I just sort of recently realized, oh, this is just the way things are going. You know, I don't want to miss opportunities or have people that may or may not be less talented than me be getting things because they have more followers and that's what people are looking for now because it's just, you know, it's just business. Uh, they want more eyes on whatever project they're having. So, you know, there's things like you have to adapt. So that's something, you know, I I'm getting someone to like post all my clips because like all the work is already done, but I mean, I, that's not what I wanted to do, but like that it has to be something I have to make a change for, you know, for success and for business wise or just mm -hmm. things like that. I mean, I think there, unfortunately to be a comic now you have to do so many things. It's like, you're not just doing stand up. Like you have to be professional at marketing. You have to be, know how to edit. You know, have to know. I mean, like, just you have to act. You have to write. You have to be a TikToker. You have to do so many. You have different to have a podcast. Things. Yeah. yeah, it's it's really really crazy. So I do think, like, if you don't want it bad enough, like, I don't know how you can even stick. And honestly, I respect those people that quit because why do all that if it's not what you really want? Yeah, yeah. It's it's um. It is funny as you say that. I it's I was watching The Wizard of Oz the other night with my 
I know with my in-laws and my um, daughter who might be <laughs> too young to be watching that movie. I was like, I don't think she should see the flying monkeys part. She's not even two, but she loves the um, lollipop guild. She's obsessed and yeah. just wants us to play that clearly. And we were watching that and we were talking about how back in those studio days you had to be good. We, I was like, these people were so talented. You had to be good at singing, at dancing, at you were, tr they were all triple threats, all of them. To even oh. get into the studio system, you had to just be proficient at all of those things because they were all dancing and singing in like all, every single movie. And this was oh, back in like so 1939. Yeah, I've never were... thought about that because I did, have you ever read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo? No. You should read it. It's an awesome book. I just read it recently. I think they're adapting it. Reese Witherspoon, she adapts every popular book. But um, yeah. it's like that the thing where they would just like. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. They just pick up any like hot chick at the diner and like give them a three-year deal. But I do get what you're saying. Um <laughs> That's Maybe. so funny. That was my I favorite wonder... movie growing up. And I, my mom would be like, I couldn't watch The Wicked Witch or The Flying Monkeys like when I was 13 years old and you were three years old and you would go in my cabinet and rewind The Wicked Witch parts. And she thought something was like wrong with me because she was afraid. And then I, 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 and then I would have like nightmares about it, but I like couldn't look away. Yeah, that I feel like my daughter is similar in that way. She's a we, she got obsessed with Home Alone over the break, like over Christmas. And now she's like Home Alone and she's like Chuck Berry because she loves the Run Run <laughs> Rudolph song. We were on a plane and she's like, Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry. We're like, what is she talking about? And we didn't realize she wanted to watch Home Alone. I was like, oh, she wants to watch Home Alone. Why is she, she is crying about movie. Chuck Berry? That's yeah, a good movie. It, it's such a good movie, but there's that part where, you know, he gets all shot up by the Tommy gun and she loves that. I'm like, this is, I don't think she should be watching this. I think she's too young. Um, we're like, should she be? It's always that weird thing as a parent. We're like, should she be watching this? Probably not. Probably too young for this, but she seems to now she's into the Wizard of Oz and wants to see when the the tornado part. We always skip through to when it's color because she gets kind of bored in the beginning with the sepia. She's like, what is this? And um, <laughs> what is this old timey no color? And now she loves the tornado part. So, yeah, I don't know. Oh, she kids likes like the excitement. Sure yeah, she does. I really want to uh, get married and have a baby. What's it like doing comedy with a baby? Um, she's at that age where it's actually like a good time for me. I feel like I was, um, actually recently just like DMing with Lori Kilmartin. And I was like, how did you do this when you were, cause she was talks about being a single mom and she's like, I had a lot of help. I'm like, how'd you do this when she was little, when your son was little and She's like, I had a lot of help. And she was saying, honestly, now it's like a little bit more challenging because he's a teenager and they need you around more at night, especially because they're up and teenagers. And I was like, OK, so I've got a little bit of a window <laughs> yeah. where I can because I can put her down and go out and do, you know, or my husband can. And I have my husband who's very hands on and helpful. So it's um. The hardest thing I think is like the line I try to walk is talking more about my experience as a parent and respecting her privacy as a kid. I know most comedians probably don't even consider this, but in the like age of social media and all that stuff, I still feel like she should she shouldn't necessarily have things that are like haunting her forever. Um that I yeah. talked about on stage or whatever. So that's like a, that's a weird balance. I don't necessarily want to use her for material. And I have, I get really uncomfortable when even on social media, not even comedians, just even normies or people who are influencers use their kids as props. It makes me so I'm like, uh, I, I'm just not, also, I am in the weird like culture war and I know too much about all the like AI and all the weird crap coming out with images and like I'm like, no, I don't want to. So that's that's the heart. I would say the harder thing is is 
not necessarily balancing it. Although like last night I did a set, came home, was up late, just writing through some of the stuff that was not working. And, um, finally got my head like it's like the minute my eyes close she will wake up whenever that happens and then I'm like I have no sleep so that can be a little challenging that is challenging wow yeah I get what you're saying I mean I I struggle like I I don't even love like putting my family um on line now I just it's weird it's different than what I used to feel like like (laughs) I was, I even did a podcast a few days ago and they were like asking me the names of my family and like later, and I gave them all the names because he just kept asking me. He was just like joking around. And then I just felt weird like that. I even said all of my family members, yeah. like first and last names on a podcast. Like, <laughs> and, I, and I think about that too. I'm try to be really cognizant of what I say about my family. Like, even if I'll, a joke pops in my head, I'm like, I I don't want to say anything that I'll regret, even if like I mean it in, you know, a nice way. And I have even my best friend and like many other friends don't think like that at all. You know, they just say they're like, all's fair. And and for me, it's not like that at all. Yeah, I'm I'm actually struggling with that now because there's a joke that I want to make that could be it's dark and it I've made it before and it gets laughs and it's it it's like not funny because it's true but it's also why it's funny but it's a joke about someone in my life who passed away and um they have kids and so I'm like uh oh right uh, yeah. yeah like that feels even though they're not my kids so I kind of fuck them but like they're I don't know there's I've never really, that's always been a weakness. Like, I feel like I've never really had that killer instinct that a lot of people who are successful have. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's, uh, I don't know if it's a killer instinct, though, because it really does have to feel natural to you. Otherwise, you're not going to feel good about it. You yeah. know, like, um, and so I think that you're going, uh, unfortunately, even though, you know, it could be a good joke, you're going along with what's authentic to you. You know, I'm not going to feel good putting that out into the world. Like I'm just a sensitive person yeah. versus some people aren't. And I do, I do think it gets messy for these people. Like if, you know, they may not necessarily have super close relationships all the time with the people that they're shitting on or you know they have an understanding where those people are so cool where they just are it doesn't it's not a problem you know yeah it's hard to I think as a there's a great line in um oh I think it's right behind me Joan Didion has this line hold on I'm gonna grab the book because I love her is it from the white album it, no, but I have the White Album sitting right here. It's from Slouching Towards Bethlehem. Um, it's from the preface, which I absolutely love. And she says at the end of it, um, she's like, my only advantage as a reporter is that I am so physically small, so temperamentally unobtrusive, and so neurotically inarticulate that people tend to forget that my presence runs counter to their best interests. And it always does. That is one last thing to remember. Writers are always selling somebody out. <laughs> and I'm yes. like, it's so true. Because I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm a writer first. Uh, that is that is like my, uh, that comes more naturally to me, I think, than even being a performer. And uh, there is that truth of like, I, I run into this balance of even in writing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know I do too. And, but I do know that when I have gone against that voice in my head that says like, I don't think that I'm comfortable with what I just said, it plagues me after. And then it disturbs my sense of peace. So I do just try to listen to that because like the the thing is, it is true. And it is difficult, especially in this age of podcasting. I mean, you'll say things because it just feels like you're having a conversation with a friend that maybe you wouldn't want to have on the internet in 10 years. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That was something 
that I had this article that was kind of, it was like, a, I put it on my sub stack and it went viral. It was, it was um, about how I regret being a slut. And it was, I was just looking at this time in my life and um, really how, you know, the lie, like I got sober 10 years ago and it really just the lies I told myself. A lot of it was a cope, I think. And kind of the idea that I could sleep my way to sexual empowerment and how much, how destructive it was and how, you know, I got it from the culture, not just like from my own brain yeah, and how I think women have been kind of lied to in that respect. And so I wrote it and it went viral and everybody was like, I don't know if my daughter should read this. And then I want to, you know, at publishers are like, Hey, what, there's a book here. And I was going to do kind of a book about, I don't know if my daughter should read this. And then I was pregnant at the time and, and knew she was a girl, but the more pregnant I became, the more I was like, I don't know if my daughter should read this. I don't know if I want this out there forever, particularly not before she's old enough for me to really talk to her about it. it like these stories of, of different aspects of my life that were more or less gnarly and, uh, and so I just abandoned the project completely and I probably could have made a decent amount of money writing that book. Right. Maybe I'm an idiot. No, you still can. If you, you can absolutely still do that. Should it come back to you that it's something that you all of a sudden really want to do, but I don't know. It isn't an interesting age right now because everyone theoretically is a public a person brand. kind of yeah. yeah like and um i have to say like if i wasn't a comedian i don't think i would have social media at all but you know it used to be i think way back when like uh kids really only had to deal with uh, this type of their parents past if they had parents who were like rock stars or like right. big time actors yeah or something. like your dad is tommy lee <laughs> yes exactly and i don't seems like a lot of those kids like still love the their parents for because I mean it is hard to be like the full expression of yourself as an artist when you're constantly thinking about that you know what I mean about the the ramifications of like your child it, totally. it is totally yeah I have family members who kind of struggle with this and that because they want to be creative but they have older kids and it's like they said to me the other day, you know, you're lucky you are already in this position and and your kid doesn't already have like one idea of you that then if you decided to go kind of put yourself out there publicly would embarrass them or make them they grow up with it as opposed to it being this new thing. So I think you're right. There's you know, there's a lot of truth to the idea that they just grow up with it and they get used to it and they they have to adapt to that too with their parent being out there uh but there is there and it do, I do find that it's I mean there's already so much <laughs> like uh, I'm going to have a lot to answer for you know it's I never thought I was going to have a kid either I just didn't yeah, I was 40 I was 42 I, when I got pregnant so what, I thought really? that that's yeah. so inspiring to me. I find that really inspiring. I, I'm loving like all this uh, girls sort of like my generation, the generation above me having kids, um, seeing them do it uh, and be comedians because like, I mean, of course there were the ones that came before us, but now it's becoming like more common, especially that I think for the most part, dads, this generation are more hands-on than the They're ones before. They're way more hands-on. It's crazy. Yeah. And there was a whole crew of us, like Sarah, Rosebud, Whitney. I, I think all of us had kids within the past. I mean, they all had kids within the past, like, you know, six months. Yeah. It, yeah. It's been really interesting. Whitney, like all these people, Esther's pregnant. Um yeah, it's just it's really cool watching um watching it and and it just makes me be like, "Oh, okay, I can do that too." Um but yeah, it's a weird thing and I think everyone handles it differently. Of course, you know, men, I don't know, it is it's very odd experience. Yeah. I do I do think like it's um and too, 
I'm not in, I'm still kind of in a position where I'm not getting paparazzi. So I can, I have the option of kind of not showing my kid. If I knew my kid was going to end up in photographs, I'd probably be like, F it and just put them out there and have control over it. You know, I don't. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, like Rosebud, <laughs> Rosebud's my best friend. She like, uh, I, I she love her. Filmed her entire IVF thing on her Instagram, and I it was it's just so funny. Like we can be so different in that way. Like I I froze my eggs like years and years ago, and I remember like telling my mom, and my mom being like, "Don't tell anyone that." You know, it's just like such a different, <laughs> it's like such a different generation, you know, of things. Um, it's so weird though, Blair. I'll talk about this on stage and the 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 like gap is and even millennials seem old now to me. That even yes. I'll see millennial content where they're like, I'm like, you guys aren't I'm Gen X. So I'm like, you guys oh. aren't even that old, but they're acting like they're the old timers online yeah. now, which is very strange and disorienting to me. I'm like, please stop acting like you're old timers, but I get it because the younger kids have been born into this and it is like you said a different generation completely like I literally watched a woman who's all about like home birthing give birth basically on Instagram and I'm like isn't that weird can you my my grandmother you can't she had 10 kids and there's not a single photograph of her pregnant not oh wow yes that's one. crazy yeah <laughs> That's really interesting. She would be, and the audience, if they're young, they're like, no, that's not weird. Right. Like, I live stream myself taking a shit today. Why, what's weird about this? You know, know. like they're, they don't think it's weird. Yeah, I actually, I really resisted getting TikTok for a long time and then I got it and it's actually my favorite social uh, media to consume. And, uh, but I see the craziest shit on there, like, some of these like girls I like, follow, they'll be like film themselves sobbing. And I'm like, I just, <laughs> I could never, you know, but I love it. I like, I, it's fascinating to me, you know, because it's fascinating social media and the culture and like, you know, us as a society, we've all become sort of performative. We're, we're all performing our lives to some degree, you know? And to see how curated people are versus, you know, the other approaches where people put it all out there. And that's honestly just as shocking sometimes. But that's what I love about TikTok. <laughs> My algorithm is so pure and wholesome. Like, I don't have any stand up on there. It's like chiropractor, baby goats, pitbulls, babies, makeup. Um, what do you, you know, put on TikTok? It's not what I'm posting. That's just what I consume. Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, all my TikTok friends are like the algorithm is so good on on TikTok. Yeah, because I don't follow anyone on Instagram. So I don't do any scrolling on there because I just mm. found it too much of a time suck where it would be like an involuntary uh, thing like I wouldn't even be intentionally pulling it up and I would be like I don't want to be intaking this much information about this person I played volleyball with 20 years ago who lives in North Dakota now you know yeah it is funny the the stuff you can glean even from you know I was thinking about this the other day just how savvy we've become in observing people's social media. So my cousin's wife a year ago or a year and a half ago, like changed her profile picture to just her and the kids. And I was like, huh? And I knew I was like, that's interesting. And then it was just her. And I was like, they're fucking separated. And then yeah. lo and behold, I hear that they're separated. And then it's like inevitably a picture of her doing CrossFit with new boobs. And I'm like, yeah. And then, and then she's like, the divorce is final. I yeah. was like, fuck, man. But you can, people oh, you can are so sensitive to that. Yeah. No, you can sense the energy immediately. Like someone who would never post starts posting like hot pics, like, <laughs> you know, and that's the thing. Like that is the thing. Like if you post your boyfriend a lot, if something goes down, like people will know immediately. But I guess that's just something if you are someone who shares it all that you just share that, you know? Yeah, that it is funny, though. 
I was thinking about just how savvy the audience has become. We've all become these like little detectives without even becoming aware of it. The like small, minute change in someone's avatar triggers this like, huh. Yeah, you're like, I have a hunch. What's going Seems on here? Seems like something's like all isn't right. Yeah, the yeah. minute the husband gets cut out of the like family picture, you're like, uh-oh. Yeah. Trouble in paradise. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like Twitter kind of made me, so I, I resist hating on it too badly. Made me in the sense that it gave me all the opportunities to meet editors so that I could have a career as a writer and then it's been like a giant game of improv ever since but that I like that there are no gatekeepers in that sense other than like these big tech conglomerates who you know can censor and and like decide who to elevate or not but or China um but I do think it's still ultimately better than when there were just a few gatekeepers yeah, you know what? It is nice to uh, the industry ha- seems to have been to truly be in free fall the last four years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just constant mergers, constant layoffs. Like, you know, you're in one place and then they get fired. Someone else. I mean, they just got bought. It's just it is nice to put agency into the hands of people. Like if you really want to be successful on social media, you can do it. You just have a willingness. You have to have a point of view and a willingness to aggressively put yourself out there in a way that honestly just feels disgusting. But, <laughs> but it does, but like it is incredible. I mean, there's so many people successful now. Like I'll see some people where I'm like, I truly think they are one of the worst comedians I have ever seen, but, but I will respect a thousand percent anyone with work ethic and someone who found a way to cultivate an audience. Do I necessarily think it's great for comedy? No, but I will be like, That's impressive. Whatever I think of their talent, I am impressed about what they did and built for themselves. And I'll respect that, you know, because a lot of these people would never have a career, even podcasting. Like there's people that have great podcasts. And because fans are so loyal to those people that they get to know through years of listening to them every week, they have a stand up audience. And it's not that they're necessarily a great stand up, you know. But more power to them, you know, like they have an audience and they have people that care about what they have to say. And I will respect that always. And I think as it's like that kind of theory of abundance as and I've seen this even just in Austin as like all the all the muscle. What did you call them? Like the the muscle bros, the buff guys moved here. And but the comedy scene now, there's so it's like there's room it just becomes more abundant. Now there's more of a halo effect. There are people coming into town. You can, you can easily do like seven sets in a night and at all the different places that are popping up and more people are having shows and there's just more of a comedy scene than, uh, so I think it's, I ultimately think that, even though it's like all siloed, I think it's, it's that whole idea of like, it's better to have 2000. I'm not sure who came up with this prince, this theory, but there's the theory that it's better to have 2000 devoted plan fans than, um, 2 million who are just kind of like scroll through your content. Oh, a hundred percent. I will see that, uh, all the time people, they won't necessarily have, um, a huge following, but they have like a rising podcast or something. So their, their, their fans are really devoted, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's great. Yeah. It's, it's such a, like, it is true though, the mergers and everything. I'm even just being in the writing and media, like you, you were, I was at Playboy and then that guy, it was like every, I feel like every single platform or place that I've gone or whatever, it's just been like, merging it's just nuts. Folds gets bought by someone 
Um, you know, they hire in new people that changes all the asks and their changes what they're they're changing their target audience because for their the new people's existing advertiser and really blah, 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 you know because yeah. it's crazy yeah it does make you feel disgusting that is very true i was watching a whole clip with louis where he was talking about how bad he thinks it is because he can see comedians tailoring the algorithm shaping the comedian instead of the other way around just how it starts to it, it is that uh, sense of like audience capture, your your audience and the algorithm and all these things start to influence you in subtle ways because you're, you're f- chasing the the likes instead of the, the actual, you know, thing you're trying to say. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's definitely watering down comedy. I mean, even when you go to a show, I would say that the heckling has increased dramatically in the last year or two because what the public is seeing who may or may not already have a relationship with comedy is they're just being saturated with clips on Instagram. That's crowd work. And so they think that's what comedy is. So, you know, if you're really into what your act and writing and stuff and you go and you want to prepare, you know, the act, you wanted to deliver the act that you have prepared, you know, with so much work and they're just wanting to like yell back and forth with you because that's what they think comedy oh, is. That's really you interesting. Know? I was wondering why I was like, is Austin just like love crowd work? Is this just a crowd work town? But you're right. It's, it is, it did not occur to me that this is really what they're ingesting online from, from everybody. Yeah. And I, I read some statistic. I don't even know what the percentage is. It was high. It was like 50, 60, 70 percent or something. I don't know the number. But like when people go to a comedy show, it's their first time a lot of times. So, you know, if they're seeing that online, like I have a neighbor who always asks me about like crowd work guys, like, have you seen them? Like, I don't follow anyone. So I don't know. And then I'll like, I'm like, oh my god, that guy I did open mics with. Like you, I'm like, you think he's funny? You know what I mean? Um, but some people, contrary to that, are incredible at crowd work, and so yeah. now they have an avenue for a career. And really, that's awesome. That's great for them. You know? Yeah. I always see Sam Morrill, who I love. Like I think his joke writing is some of the best but then his crowd work is incredible too like i saw something the other day that i was like fucking sam yeah (laughs) he's just so quick on his feet he is i i love sam especially for just you know like the straight club style like he he is someone who he's been doing it for so long and he really is a i think you can tell he's so deeply influenced by dave attell and and has such integrity with the precision that he puts into writing. So for him, who he, I know he has like blown up his audience through his crowd work, but for me, like, I'm like, Oh, he still maintains the integrity completely with his act. And yeah, he's just using that as a vehicle to get people out to his shows for his act that he puts so much effort into his joke writing is amazing it, yeah. it's like he really yeah he's definitely like that kind of i feel like old school comedian joke writer just yeah, cla- yeah. like a classic comedian <laughs> yeah i mean he works his ass off and a lot of yeah. people there's even people you know that what you'd say is like a classic and you're like oh it's just sounds you know corny or whatever but he always has a really unique spin on everything how did you you know your 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 voice that you use in your act is that how did that come to be oh that's interesting you mean like modulation or what yeah um it's just sort of natural like I don't know people always talk about my voice I don't I don't uh, consciously use a different voice in my act. I mean, I do go into like probably my like WWF, WWE voice. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I think it's just a lower octave than when I hear you talking like in an interview. Yeah, I'll go up and down. I think that probably started um, 
when I was really nervous uh, when I first started that I felt like I had to be really authoritative um, because people always comment on my voice. Um, but it has all worked out because I, you know, do a lot of cartoons and stuff now, but, um, yeah, it was, that's the thing that like trolls will say to me. Although people are always like, that's, you want a voice like that to be a comedian. Yeah. No, it was more like, I, it was interesting. I was listening to your special and I was like, I feel like I would, listen to her more because it sounds more masculine. <laughs> like, I'm like, is this the internalized misogynist in me? <laughs> oh. where, where I was like, these, these jokes land differently because it, it is in like this WWE wrestling kind of voice. I, I don't, I don't even know how to articulate it. It was like, it's so different. It's just oh, so cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably internalized misogyny, but also, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also me just being silly and sort of natural. Like, I that's what feels natural to me. Like, people are like, is that something that you calculated doing? I'm like, no. And it's not like I talk like that the entire time. It's just like moments of the, you know, it's like I'm using my normal voice and then like for emphasis or for jokes or when I'm doing someone else's voice or something like that, you know. It's so great. I was like, it's so, I don't know. It wasn't fun. It was a Thank fun you. special. Thank What's you very your, much. I, I think everyone should check it out. It's, it's, um on veeps and it's just like i love when i see a stand-up comedy special that's like clearly well written jokes but it's just different it was fun and you obviously were having a blast which i really <laughs> thank appreciate you. thank you that really means a lot to me i my favorite performers it's good writing and also unexpected performance yeah you know Sometimes when I'm watching incredible comedians and because after you've seen so much comedy, like sometimes I'll be watching and I'll be like, that's an incredible joke, but I'm not laughing. You know what yeah. I mean? I'll yeah, just yeah. like say to myself, whoa, that's a great joke, but it didn't make me laugh. Like, I think there's something I am personally drawn to uh wild people, you know, like Eddie Pepitone, where you just like never know I what's going to come out of their mouth and you're just so everything shocking, like <laughs> um, R Rory Scovel, but not shocking in like the shock jock way, shocking in that you're like, wow, this is really odd, but I am having such a great time, you know? So I, I sort of, as you can see, uh, like to go to more of a silly, silly uh, type of comedy. Yeah, no, it's so fun. And it it's I that's actually like a really interesting point about a really well written joke that you don't laugh at. Cause I, I've had that experience and is is it just like could there be a different delivery that would make me laugh at that amazing joke? Probably. I think it's honestly the audience laughs at a really well written joke, but it's when you have just seen so much comedy, like you can just see where it's going. Or even if you can't see where it's going, you're just like, you get numb, not even just from the sheer volume of what you're yeah, seeing yeah. doing comedy every night, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes wonder too, like uh, I, I have a hard time discerning, when something feels hacky to me, but it's like sometimes the low hanging fruit is just the funny joke that the audience laughs at and they find it surprising. And I'm like, why do they find this surprising? Yeah, <laughs> But I again, mean, it's like, I don't know if it's just that you're numb to that. That's like how your brain works as a comedian is that's where you would go. But I take it for granted that not everybody thinks like that. Yeah, well, I think there's a difference between hacky and simple because sometimes the most simple mm. thing is the most funny like when I watch Nate Borgazzi I am just stunned I'm just like he made I think sometimes he gets the things that 
some comedians would just miss because they're like, no, that's too simple. And you're like, oh, no, sometimes simple is the most funny, you know? And yeah. then, then there's other people that you watch and you're just like, oh, that's hacky. Like everyone could have seen that. That's a meme, you know? Right, right. But everything's a meme now. Yeah, I mean, it depends. <laughs> I'm like, everything's a meme. We're yeah. all memes. What's your yeah. biggest defect of character? Oh, honey. How much time we got? As much um, as you want. <laughs> what's my biggest defect of character? Um, probably, probably <laughs> in terms of comedy or just in life? In life or comedy, but whatever, whatever, whatever you want to answer that question with, the question is yours. Comedy has probably been social media. Like, I think I could have been a lot bigger at this point had I been in that game already, like putting out the stuff I've already, <laughs> the work is already done. I just yeah. need to put it out Feed there. the but, algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Um, as a person, my biggest defect of character, um, I think sometimes I, per, I uh, struggle with forgiveness. And that's something I pray about all the time because I really want to be a forgiving person. But I talk about this in therapy all the time where I'm like, okay, well, I think some of the like those scenarios, those certain ones where I worry about it, where I'm like, why do I still feel resentment? Like, I don't want to feel resentment. There's also just a natural, sometimes you grow apart from people, you know, like you don't have to keep every relationship. Uh, I mean, it's not natural to keep every relationship as we grow and evolve and move on through different points of our lives and yeah, all that stuff. But I would love to be, I mean, I'm Italian. I would love to let some things go a little bit easier because I, yeah. I, I'm a pretty gentle soul. So I approach people, I think, with a lot of sensitivity sort of anticipating how my behavior or words could affect them. All scenarios. I mean, it looks, which is ironic being a comedian. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not acting like a saint or anything here. I am <laughs> far, like not saying I'm like whatever, some perfect person in any way. But, you know, like when someone wrongs me, like wrong, wrong, wrongs me. And so they'll give me like a good apology. It's hard for me to let go. Like I like I'm like, oh, my trust is broken. You know, I yeah. So that's something I'm working on. And that probably stems from not having great boundaries when I was younger and like, you know, feel like letting people walk all over me a little bit too much. So then you kind of overcorrect. But I'm not religious at all, but I have like a very uh, close. Re I pray a lot like a, with uh, God. And I'm always praying, like, let me forgive. Like, let me empty out that, you know, those blockages inside me, you know? Yeah. I love that. What's your biggest asset? What's my biggest asset? Damn. That's that's crazy. These are, uh, are these I feel vulnerable uh, proclaiming these things about myself. Um, almost more vulnerable saying my asset than my defect. Um, I think that's normal. <laughs> yeah. Most uh, people find the asset harder than the defect, which is sad. And I also understand it. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I think I'm smart. Like I like that about myself. And I think I'm very curious. Like I, I have a real drive to always like, just a natural curiosity and desire to learn and improve. Like, and I have, a, I get like interested in a lot of different things all the time. I've always been like that since I was a kid. Um, I guess. I don't you know. You were the youngest of, and had older brothers, right? Yeah. How many older brothers did you have? I have two older brothers that are 11 months apart. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, 
I didn't have any older brothers and I probably could have used them. <laughs> really? Yeah, I think you just I think it's I think it's good to have older brothers as a girl. <laughs> I guess I don't know like I grew up the masculinity and like my father's like a very like alpha uh masculine man like I grew up thinking that a lot of my natural I it made me I mean I love my guy friends and stuff but ultimately it made me into like a hardcore girl's girl like I cherish my female friendship so much and I think about when I was younger, just growing up in my house, like wanting my brothers to like me and to feel included that if they said like something I liked or that girls like was stupid, like I thought a lot of just female things were not cool mm, just on uh, the whole because of growing up in that way. And like I grew out of that so quickly once I we were all out of the house uh, and I – and I was like, wait, that's not how I feel. Like, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. But it did expose me. You know, I do have quite a literacy on a lot of male things like, you know, sport. I just uh, all that stuff. Yeah. And probably insight into like the psyche. <laughs> yes, I do think so. But now as an adult, like I wish to God I had a sister like when you're an adult having a sister and like my girlfriends truly are like my sisters. It is just like such a family. That's the type of closeness that I do pity men that they'll never experience female friendship uh, because it is like, I think the big, the most incredible thing it is. Um, they'll just, they'll never know the depth of the friendships, you know, but like, yeah. I li I like, like my girlfriend's, now that are adults and you know having kids and stuff that have sisters it's like they just kind of run the family all the family events they always get to like do everything together you know my my brothers it's like the wives run the show you know right right yeah so well this has been so fun getting to know you and yeah. i look forward i hope you are you going to be in austin anytime soon Right now I'm coming for Moon Tower, but I would like to start going more. I would love to make it like a regular thing and start. I think a lot of people there. are doing that. It's it just looks really fun and I would like to, you know, be a regular out there. Yeah, I was just I saw Jessica Michelle last night, Singleton, and she's like, I think I have to start coming here like once a quarter at least. You know, I'm like, yeah, it'd be it's it would be so easy to do. It's such an easy flight from LA and it's you can run around and I know, in, I just need to figure out a place to stay because it's like I'd like to go for just like a week at a time and chill. And like, you know, I've always wanted to like go float down the river. And every time I go, I'm always there for like two days and like prepping for a show or something, you know. Yeah, I I mean yeah. I I can offer you oh, always a room I here. Say that. I know no you one have wants a baby. To, no, no one wants to stay here though because we're like way out in the burbs. So it's it's um it's a hike. So, but you you can always stay out in the quiet burbs if you need <laughs> need some I reprieve mean, I think from that the city. Great, but thank you so much. It was really fun to meet you. And where can we find you? Please, um, I'm on. All my socials are at Blair Saki, B-L-A-I-R-S-O-C-C-I. And um, I would love for you to check out my special live from the big dog on Veeps. The link is in all my bios for social media. So it's really easy. Also, on we'll my put it in the description here, too. Yeah, it's also on my website, BlairSaki.com. So many places to find it and would love to have you. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. coming. Thanks for having me. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>